Paul, I've been fascinated with science and theology my whole life. Some people would say obsessed. And then I realized there were a lot of other people that uh, were interested. You've been interested in it for a great deal of time. And today there's really a very large amount of popular interest. Why, why is that? I think there's something of an industry in science and theology, <laughs> and people define a subject area, science and theology or science and religion. Uh, well, I, all I can tell you is my own experiences. So when I was a teenager, I can well remember, I, I think I was uh, 16 and uh, was struck by the problem of free will. I'd learned in uh, my mm. physics classes that the brain uh, does what the brain has got to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the atoms uh, move in accordance with the laws of physics. So how then did I have this uh, sense of freedom? Uh, and I was deeply worried about this. And at the time I used to go to a, a church uh, youth club in London. Uh, I might say largely to meet girls, <laughs> but nevertheless, from time to time, we would have deep and meaningful discussions <laughs> with the, the vicar at this uh, youth club. And I can remember raising the issue of uh, free will and determinism. And of course, we got nowhere in that discussion. And I thought, well, I'm only going to get the answer to this by becoming a scientist. Mm. And so I, I thought, well, I would go into physics because I was really interested in these deeper issues. Then, of course, I found over the years I was working on things like the origin of the universe, the nature of time, the nature of consciousness has always fascinated me. Things which for uh, centuries or millennia have been exclusively the province of priests and philosophers, but I was coming at them from a scientific point of view, along with many of my colleagues. And so inevitably, we were raising again those age-old questions of existence. How did the universe come to exist? Uh, how is it going to end? What is the place of human beings in this great uh, scheme of things? Is there a meaning to it all? Uh, and so it was quite natural to then reapproach this uh, uh, subject of science and theology from the scientific side. Now with some real data, with a, a whole different uh, a methodology to approach the subject. When I was a student, uh, people used to say there's speculation, there's speculation squared, and then there's cosmology. <laughs> uh, people use the term cosmology, but almost nothing was known. Now we realized that the universe was expanding, but that was about it. Mm. Today, it's a real quantitative science. It's possible to fill in all the details from the first split second after the Big Bang onwards. And we've got a pretty good idea of uh, how the universe is put together and how it's behaving. So now we can come at these problems uh, from the point of view of a proper quantitative science. Of course, uh, the really deep issues of existence, such as people always want to say what happened before the Big Bang, or uh, what caused the Big Bang, or uh, why is the universe just right for life? Where do the laws of physics that run the universe come from? Those uh, really deep things, they're uh, much harder to answer. And so even with the benefit of all of the recent data, uh, those issues are still very contentious, lots of scope for disagreement. Let's talk about the three that you say are, are subject to scientific analysis. Uh, the origin of the universe, the nature of time, and, and the nature of consciousness. Those were your big three that you mm. put out on the table for us, at least to, to explore. Uh, what, what can we say tops of trees about each of them? Well, as far as the origin of the universe is concerned, uh, we're pretty certain that uh, the universe as we know it now uh, stretches back only some billions of years. It didn't always exist. It came into existence uh, abruptly with a sort of explosive outburst that we call the Big Bang. Now, whether that was the ultimate origin of everything is still a matter of dispute. Some people think, well, it was the beginning of space and time. Uh, indeed, that's an ancient idea. It goes back uh, at least as far as Saint Augustine of Hippo, who said that the world was made with time and not in time. So it's possible that that is the case, that the universe uh, was the birth not just of matter and energy, but space and time as well. Uh, it's equally possible that what we call the Big Bang is just one bang among uh, many, maybe an infinite number, scattered throughout space and time. And so it's the beginning of our region of the universe, but the entire assemblage is eternal. Now, there are deep problems about that too. Uh, the, these are uh, problems that are not new to cosmologists. Uh, when I was a student, there was a, a, another theory about the universe called the steady state theory, which held that uh, it had no beginning and it had no end, uh, and that as the universe expanded, matter was continually created to, as it were, fill up the gaps. Um, and this theory was specifically invented to avoid the problem of an ultimate origin mm -hmm. of the universe. But it really only sidestepped the issue, because one could still ask, 
why was there a universe in the first place? Pushing its origin back to minus infinity really didn't help at all. You could still say, why did the universe exist? And the analogy I often used to use is, uh, imagine somebody gave you a book, uh, but it had no author. And you said, well, who wrote this book? And you were told, well, it was just copied from uh, an earlier <laughs> version, and that was copied from an earlier version, and, and the book sort of wrote itself, or it had no, no author. Uh, it just happened to exist. So by uh, saying that something doesn't have an origin, doesn't explain why it exists or why it has the features that it does. Mm. And I feel the same about eternal inflation, whether there's one Big Bang or many, and if there are many, perhaps the whole thing never had a beginning ever. Uh, that still doesn't explain why it exists or why it has the properties mm. that it does. Mm. Why does this assemblage uh, permit the uh, emergence of universes in Big Bangs all over the place? Where do the laws that govern that come from? So you're really just pushing the problem further back. Uh, nevertheless, it may be true. It's a matter of science and a matter of observation to determine whether what we call the universe is all there is, and it has an ultimate origin in space and time at the Big Bang, or whether it is a small component in this larger assemblage. It may be tough to determine observationally. And, and then the nexus with theology comes whenever you are forced to stop, whether the, this Big Bang was the origin or you go back an infinite time and you have to evaluate why does this whole thing exist. That's where theology would make it stand, so to speak. I think there's a real issue here about the nature of time, and this is something that's interested me right that's from the, the start. Um, issue. Right, but it, but it has to do with this whole business of origins, because uh, most people, I think, in the, the, the popular imagination, that the problem of science and theology is the problem of how did it all begin? People say, well, you sound is very clever, um, but uh, you can't explain what made the Big Bang or what happened before the Big Bang, as if that somehow uh, undermines the whole yeah. scientific agenda. And the implication is, well, God made the Big Bang go bang. Uh, but actually, it's a very bad theology. The idea that there is a pre-existing sort of cosmic magician who is there uh, within time for all eternity, and at some particular moment thinks, oh, I'll make a universe, <laughs> and then presses a button and bang, yeah. there's the universe. Um, I think that's an idea that serious theologians abandoned a long time ago. And it was, incidentally, the reason that uh, Augustine said the world was made with time and not in time, because uh, early Christians were being ridiculed uh, for the fact that uh, uh, their God uh, was apparently unoccupied uh, for all <laughs> eternity until making a universe. And so this was his way, Augustine's way, of avoiding that problem, mm. uh, to have, the have God outside of time altogether and uh, uh, creating the universe along with time. Uh, and so, uh, but, but most people don't understand that. Most people think uh, that the universe could not come into existence at some particular moment without having a causative agent, some body or something there before it to make it happen. But Einstein told us that time, like space, is part of physical reality and the origin of the universe, the ultimate origin, would involve the origin of space and time as well as matter and energy. Uh, and so uh, we can't really use the normal terms of causation. Uh, we can't talk about what happened before the Big Bang in that picture because the Big Bang is the origin of time. Um, and so you have to go to a more sophisticated uh, position and say, well, we can imagine uh, that there might be uh, something like a God or a creator who is outside of time altogether, as in classical Christian theology. But now we're talking not about causation in the usual sense, uh, but about explanation. Why is there a universe? Why does it have the laws that it does at all times? And so we're thinking about something which is timeless, uh, which is underpinning physical reality, guaranteeing its lawfulness. That, that's something that comes quite close, I think, to uh, sophisticated modern theology, but it's a long way from popular religion. And I'm not sure that this entity, which is responsible for keeping the universe in being at all times, really comes very close to the personal God of popular religion.